I'm Adam Green. I'm the writer and the director of Digging Up the Marrow. You know, I get sent very weird things from, from fans. I mean, most of it, it's just, you know, the nicest letters you'd ever get. But then sometimes there's some, some stuff that really stands out because it's kind of weird or creepy. And this fan had basically written not just a letter, but it was a full package claiming that Victor Crowley, who is the villain in the Hatchet series that we do, that he's actually real and that I had messed up the whole telling of his story and I didn't do it right. And in this package there were photographs of, of, of swamp areas in New Orleans and areas were circled, this is where he really grew up, this is where he died, this is where the murders happened. And I mean, as far as fan mail goes, maybe save for some of the artwork and, and you know fan fiction that people send, it was one of the most compelling and artistic letters that I had ever gotten. I was doing an autograph signing at a Fangoria convention here in LA. And uh, this guy came up through the line and he handed me this pamphlet called Digging Up the Marrow. He was there presenting Hatchet 2, I believe at the time, or at least previewing it. I was a fan of Adams from, from Hatchet 1, and I, I just happened to see him and I was like, oh, like, like, I don't have anything to offer in exchange for like your inspiration that you gave me, but here's this thing that I have, and it was just uh, this pamphlet, it was this zine that I had done based around the art show that I had done around the Marrow. And, and that was kind of how we met. <laughs> was, I was just all, here, I'm a fan, so, you know. And, um... I started reading the pamphlet that night and the whole conceit of it was that, you know, whenever Alex does an art exhibit, it's not just sticking up paintings that he's done. He goes several steps beyond that and there's always a storyline to it. And Digging Up the Marrow was the story of William Decker, a former police detective who claimed that monsters were real and that he knew where they were. And he didn't take Alex to actually see the monsters, but he basically commissioned Alex uh, to paint the things that he described that he had seen. And you know, the whole thing's made up. But as I'm looking at these monsters and I'm thinking about that story and then the fan who had sent me the letter and it was just all sort of clicked. And I think it was like two or three in the morning and I started texting Corey and, and Will being like, well, I, I, I think I, fit, I, I, I got this, I got this, I know what this is. And I, I contacted Alex and he came down from San Francisco and we had a meeting and shared our, our stories and, um, and it really came together that easily and, and that quickly. And for this one, especially, we were able to really sort of just hand pick the right people and, and keep it really small. And, um, you know, Robert Pennegraff, I've been working with him since the first Hatchet movie. He was originally John Beekler's shot foreman, but he had, he had done some of the best effects in that movie. And I was the one who sort of pushed him to open his own shop and, and take the lead on Hatchet 2. Hatchet 2 was where Adam convinced me to you know, open up my own shop and everything. And I was just kind of like, I have no idea where I'm going to do this at or anything. And he's like, just do it here. Cause I was had like a small section of the garage I was working with. Cause this whole place, there was a Cadillac parked in here and just all this excess furniture that my aunt had that she didn't want in the house. And he's like, try and figure if you can get it done in this garage, it'd be amazing. You can do a shop studio in here. And I was like, oh, okay. And so I went and talked to my aunt. She's like, I don't know. And I'm like, well, if we keep it all in the garage and like, you know, if people come over to work and they just don't go in the house, you know, then and is that cool? And she's like, okay, fine, that's cool. You know, pulled the Cadillac out and cleared out all the furniture in here and turned it into a shop and everything like that. And I have Adam to blame for that because now it's, I come down in here and get up out of bed and go downstairs and I'm at work. You know, on my days off, I come and hang out in the garage. I'm still at work. Alex's stuff is, is very unique. And part of the excitement of this was the monsters in our movie, because you, you got to actually see monsters at some point. Um, if they could look like Alex's vision, how cool would that be? But then how do you do that? Alex would come up with these really crazy artworks. The ones that we used were some of the ones that he came up with, and then he had other ones that were just like, no, no, 
no, you're talking about like we need like a crane to lift this thing or something. We need an operations team of like 20 people to mech this out or something like, no. I know that I don't draw in a traditional way. I know that I, you know, I make wrinkles where they don't exist. I have bone structures that probably doesn't exist, which coincidentally in this world of the marrow, that fits. In bringing Alex's artwork to three-dimensional life on screen, the, the one major hurdle that we all had to sort of address first is that Alex's artwork is not necessarily realistic. I just, I like imagining things that I haven't seen. If it's a shape, if it's a color, if it's a, a tooth, if it's a, a, a type of hand, if it's a monster, if it's a car, like I just like, I like the way things shouldn't be. And I think that that's, that's kind of where the inspiration draws from is like, how can I make this not? His creatures are not necessarily anatomically correct. Like there's not necessarily a way where something that you know of or that is really in this world could move like that or bend like that. Um, and, and things are very, very colorful, like very like light, almost Smurf blues and um, reds and, and, and you know, the joy of this was like, how do we make that be on screen? And at some point, there had to be a lot of creative liberties taken with it. We have to take these colors and kind of make them work. So like, we muted a couple things down so they weren't as bright, but for the most part, we tried to keep the same palette on those things. Yeah, Robert's really good at, you know, fabricating the stuff and doing the on-set stuff, but there was still like, how do you take Alex's artwork and go from point A to point C? Like there's a point B that's a very important part in the middle of that, which is translating Alex's art into something that could be fabricated. And that's where Greg Aronowitz came into it. I had known Adam for quite a while because we had a bunch of mutual friends, but we never really worked together because he was doing his independent projects, I was doing my independent projects, and we were both kind of working in different genres, so it didn't seem like there was a lot of crossover, but we had talked about at some point doing something, uh, but it never seemed like it was going to happen. I didn't know if Greg was going to be into this. I didn't know, but you know, I pitched him the story, and he said yes right there on the spot, which um, was, was really cool. I had just gotten back from doing a project in Paris. I was over there for a couple months, and unfortunately, uh, while I was there, I was mugged in a dark parking lot, and six guys beat the crap out of me with uh, metal batons and they like busted up my arm really bad so I was in a cast and I was in a lot of pain um, so there were some projects that I wanted to work on but I wasn't really sure what I'd be able to do because uh, you know you need both arms to, to make stuff but Adam came over and he basically brought me the the pamphlet that Alex had done about the marrow and uh, you know the artwork was super intriguing to me I loved Alex's stuff I had seen it at various conventions and stuff but what really interested me was the approach that Adam was taking that it was this like super indie movie there was only going to be like you know a dozen or so people working on the whole movie it was like a super secret underground like handmade movie and uh, you know that's just something that I really believe in and it's really hard to do and I wanted to be a part of it to see if we can make it happen. Working with Greg was one of the most surreal parts of this because I had never I had never seen somebody translate my fake weird drawings in the way that without trying to compensate the reality of them like it was like it was a genuine bring this image to life in the real world and make it believable rather than let's fix this and make it look like everything else. And having Greg on board, getting the sculpture for the first time and looking at it and going like, holy crap, this thing is exactly the freaking artwork that Alex has made. And I'm like, I'm blown away by this. And it's like, okay, we got Dagger here. We got Harlequin here. We got, you know, Blossom here. We got all these characters. These are literally the transition from paper to physical form. You, you look at, here's what came out of Alex's head and that's really awesome but now we need a version of that that can go through Greg's head through Robert's hands 
onto film. With with this project in particular, it was it was really exciting to see the transformation of it from paper to the finished product. And I think and then you know, it just felt like there was like a light shining down on this where everything just clicked so fast and worked so well cuz now you have three different artists two of which do makeup effects. Greg also directs, he also writes, Alex writes, and it's like, all right, is this gonna work? And, and it works so famously that even now to this day, Greg is still just sculpting things that Alex paints just for the fun of it and then sending it to him. Um,